uh, Professor Hassan, we all saw the president pitch a bit of a temper tantrum in the White House over alleged uh, and unspecific election fraud, as we knew he would. We've seen his lawyers uh, launching a flurry of lawsuits. Does the president really have any any kind of legal strategy going forward after the elections called for Joe Biden? Or uh, and if so, what is it? Well, uh, unless things change dramatically, either in terms of the uh, margins between the candidates, uh, or in terms of more evidence coming forward of major problems in the election, I don't see a viable legal path for Donald Trump to reverse the outcome of an election if Biden is declared the winner. So, so just to unpack that a little bit, um, you'd have to have uh, a dispute, a legal dispute, a legal claim that would be in a state that would be crucial to the electoral college outcome. And so if there's more than one state, then even finding a problem in one state might not be enough. And it'd have to be so much of a problem in that state that you could plausibly think of how it might reverse the election. Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything like that. Most of the lawsuits that have been filed over the last few days have involved things like, we want more observers in the polling place, or here's an indication of a very small problem in how uh, some particular election officials have handled some relatively small thing. There's nothing large scale. Um, there have been a couple of fraud claims uh, that have not been backed up by the evidence. One uh, in Georgia that was thrown out. There was a, another one, uh, just a complaint filed in Nevada that does not seem to provide any evidence of a claim of 3,000 fraudulent votes, which also would not be likely to make a difference even if it were proven. Um, there's one plausible legal claim out of Pennsylvania involving ballots that arrived between November 3rd and November 6th. But given the margins between the candidates, uh, I think it would actually be Donald Trump who's going to be more likely than Joe Biden who would want those votes counted at this point because it looks like Biden's going to be ahead by a pretty comfortable margin uh, by the time they're done counting the votes in Pennsylvania. Yes, uh, my understanding is that Pennsylvania state officials uh, anticipating this possible challenge uh, have actually segregated mail ballots received after Election Day. Do we have any idea about the magnitude of... Uh, the kind of lead Joe Biden might need to build up uh, for that not to be a problem in the remote contingency that uh, the Supreme Court intervenes? So those ballots can still be coming in through five o'clock today. Uh, but as of yesterday, the numbers were very low. So in Erie, Pennsylvania, for example, there were 60 ballots, six zero. So we're probably talking about something on the order of a few thousand ballots. I don't know, maybe 5,000 ballots. I don't know what's going to be uh, exactly. But um, you have to remember those ballots too, they're not going to break 100% for one candidate or the other. So, you know, in order for it to change the race, you know, it's going to have to be a very close race. You know, even if it's 60, 40 or 70, 30, one candidate, you know, you're talking about a gain of under a thousand ballots. So it's not the kind of thing that, well, there might be a good legal argument. It's not a legal argument I agree with, but there might be a good legal argument as to why those ballots should not be counted. Um, this is not a kind of suit that's going to be outcome determinative. So when uh, Donald Trump said that he wants to go to the Supreme Court, well, he could go to the Supreme Court, but it's not going to make a difference uh, on this case anyway. And it's hard to see another plausible path to get to the Supreme Court. Well, speaking of the Supreme Court, uh, there been a couple of decisions, uh, certainly one involving Wisconsin. There, there was a lot of consternation in progressive circles because certain Supreme Court justices, notably Brett Kavanaugh, were and Neil Gorsuch were taking a rather radical interpretation of state legislative prerogatives to determine election law, even against uh, the rulings of state courts. And um, what really seems to be missing from the sort of uh, red mirage uh, presidential preemptive action scenario a lot of us talked about going into the election is any sort of effort to get state legislatures to assert their control over electors, regardless of the popular vote. Uh, we really haven't heard anything like that from Republican legislators, have we? Well, to the contrary, you had some Republican legislators come out yesterday and today and say, we are not taking the vote away from the people. So even though the constitution gives the state the power to do that, the state legislature the power to do that, first of all, the state legislature have already given that power to the voters. Uh, so they'd be, you know, trying to take it away, and that would probably be too late. The only way they could even plausibly try and do it is say that there was a failure of the voters to choose, and so they have to a point, and it's not going to happen. I, you know, I know a lot of people have been worried about this. Um, if a state legislature tried to 
take away the power of voters to choose the president, it would cause massive unrest. Those legislators would be putting their own careers in danger. Uh, I don't think this is a plausible path either for Trump. So I, there really is no scenario where before the Electoral College meets on December or meets virtually on December 14th uh, to really change the outcome uh, as it's established in the next few days. Is that that's your read? It's really hard to see what that path could look like. I mean, you still could have the a death or incapacitation of a president's elect, which raises all kinds of issues. And I worry about that in times of COVID. Um, so, we, you know, we can't say there's absolutely no way that something different happens, but it's extremely unlikely. I'll just ask one last question. Um, in a book you wrote, uh, Election Meltdown, you, you argued for, and I've certainly echoed this in my own writings, you know, a, a real effort to set national standards uh, for federal elections uh, and really establish a federal right to vote and deal with all these crazy discrepancies you have uh, and a really inadequate election infrastructure in many parts of the country. Uh, you know, since we seem to have dodged a bullet and we will have an orderly transition of power, do you think, do you think there's going to be any impetus to, for election reform uh, going forward? Or are we going to be right back in the same kind of mess, hopefully without a pandemic, uh, in two to four years? It's hard to see a viable path to election reform so long as Mitch McConnell is the Senate Majority Leader. Um, Biden might propose the world's best election reform plan, but I'm guessing given how Mitch McConnell has reacted in the past to democratic election reform efforts that, that these efforts would get nowhere. That doesn't mean there can't be improvement. There could be improvement in the states. You know, I would urge state legislatures to be thinking about ways to make their voting processes uh, efficient and inclusive and uh, accurate and fair. Um, so there could be some change there, but on the national level, I don't think this is going to be the period in which that's going to happen, even though we desperately need it. So the good news is we're going to eventually have an orderly transition of power. The bad news is uh, election reform is still a bit of a pipe dream. That's that's too bad, but I'm, I'm sure you'll keep pushing. Thank you so much. Well, given, yeah, go ahead. As I said, given the kinds of problems that uh, could have happened, uh, I think we dodged a bullet uh, this time and we wouldn't have if the election were a little bit closer.